Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth meeting of the committee for 2019. Can everyone ensure that their mobile devices are switched to silent, please? I welcome Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, and John Finney, MSP, to the committee this morning. Agenda item one is Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill, oral evidence session. Um, this is our second evidence session um, this morning. Can I welcome our first panel, Bruce Adamson, Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, Joanna Barrett, Policy and Public Affairs Manager, representing Bernardo's Scotland, Children First and NSPCC Scotland, Triona Lenahan, Advocacy and Communications Manager, Global Initiative to End All Corp Corporal Punishment of Children, and Martin Canavan, Policy and Participation Officer, Aber Lauer. You're all very welcome this morning. Um, can I start things off by asking whether um, you support the aims of the Bill to stop physical punishment of children in Scotland? Bruce. Yes. Um, as Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland, my role is to promote and safeguard the rights of children and young people. And I think this is one of the most important legislative things that we can do right now to secure children's rights. Assaulting a child for the purpose of punishment should never be legal um, and is at odds with the values that we hold in Scotland. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is, is very clear that children should grow up in a family environment of happiness and love and understanding. And that while, ch while parents have the responsibility to ensure that, that um, children um, grow up in that environment, the state has an obligation to put in place um, very clear protections. And Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child says very clearly that the state needs to put in place legislative protections to ensure children um, are protected from all forms of violence. And also alongside that needs to put in place all of the guidance, support and education to allow parents to, to fulfil that role. And this bill um, meets both of those aims in terms of ensuring that the state puts in place that guidance and support and education, but also um, corrects the issue that we have at the moment where um, the assault of children is allowable for the purpose of physical punishment. This is something, as the committee is aware, that has been um, a regular feature of the international community's concern about Scotland from the United Nations, from the Council of Europe and from <coughs> the European Union. And um, I welcome John Finney's leadership in human rights leadership in this and the role that the committee will be playing as a human rights guarantor to ensure that children in Scotland have their rights respected in relation to their physical integrity. Thank you. Joanna. Yes, um, so as you said, I'm here to um, represent three um, organisations, NSPC Scotland, Bernardo Scotland and Children First. And we've been working together for a long time to advocate for this, this change. And we too commend uh, John Finney's leadership in bringing this bill before Parliament. Um, it's our strong opinion that um, the law as it stands has no place in a society which claims to be progressive and wants to do the best for its children. So we strongly advocate um, the bill that's before us today. Thank you. Joanna. Um, yes, as our name would probably suggest, we strongly support the aims of the bill as well, uh, both as a means of realising children's rights to dignity and bodily integrity, um, as well as their rights to uh, health development and education, and as a means of uh, reducing violence in families and society. Thank you. Martin. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us along to give evidence this morning. Um, yes, Abelair fully supports this bill. Yeah, and the aim of ensuring children uh, have the same protection uh, from assault as adults do um, by prohibiting physical punishment. We believe all physical punishment of children should be prohibited by law and that children require more, not less, protection from violence than adults. Um, there naturally exists an imbalance of power in adult-child relationships and as a result it's critical that children are provided with as much protection in the law as possible. Abelair has a proud history of advocating uh, against the physical punishment of children whilst promoting positive alternat alternatives to physical punishment Parenting support is a key focus of the work we do with families every day, <coughs> helping parents to become confident and secure in their parenting. The focus of a pro pro prohibition on physical punishment, we believe, uh, should not be to criminalise parents, but to protect children, not only by legislating, but promo by promoting positive alternatives to physical punishment. We need to support parents to feel who, who struggle to feel that uh, we need to support parents who struggle um, to feel that they can deliver positive parenting um, and to support and help them to become confident in their parenting. Thank you very much. Um, Alex. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for coming to see us today. Um, I should say, for the record, uh, given that Abelara represented here, that I did work as head of policy uh, with Abelara for eight years until I was elected, um, just for the record. Um, I'd like to start by uh, addressing the, the sort of perceived tension between 
adult rights and children's rights. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Waiton, who gave us evidence at the committee last week, suggested in terms of children's rights that there was no such thing. Um, there were protections, but children were in the care of their parents and, and certain evidence submissions uh, against the bill cited the right to family life as being that tension between that and Article 19. Can the panel, first of all, um, suggest whether they agree with Dr. Waiton's assertion that there are no such thing as children's rights? And secondly, um, address for us, you know, Bruce, you articulated the fact that Article 19 is a clear international expectation around children's rights to be free from violence. But are, is there a conflicting right in any treaty in international law which you could interpret as giving parents the right to physically punish their children? Um, the position that children don't have rights is completely untenable. Um, uh, we recently celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This committee had a, a human rights takeover day on the 10th of December. The first article of the Universal Declaration is that we are all born free and equal in dignity and human rights. Um, the international community has been very clear that, that children not only have rights, but have additional rights, and those have been set out um, actually within the, um, the preamble to the Universal Declaration, which, um, which identifies childhood as a time of special care and protection, and through successive um, international treaties at the UN um, Council of Europe and EU level. Um, most notably, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is 30 years old um, this year. Um, which, which, I, which I've cited, um, and which recognises that because of the um, particular um, vulnerability related to the physical and immaturity of children, that additional rights and protections are, are necessary. So um, the idea that, that children don't have rights is, is simply um, untenable in any country in the world. Um, every UN member state signed up to this um, right at the beginning of the basics of our, our human rights um, framework. So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's an argument I, I cannot understand. Um, in relation to, to any perception of a difficulty in balancing rights between the human rights of, of parents and the human rights of, of children, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has been signed up to by every UN member state bar one and a number of other um, um, non-UN member states as well for other um, countries, um, was drafted very clearly that the family environment and the role of parents um, it was, is absolutely essential. And this is about how the state can support parents and families to ensure that children can access all of their rights um, in relation to, to, to health and education and, and thriving. Um, Article 5 of the Convention sets out very clearly that the state respects the, the rights and duties of the parents um, and sets out a number of ways in which that should be done. Article 18, again, recognises um, the primary responsibility that, that parents have and goes on to say that the state has to provide um, additional support to, to parents. And so the relationship is that the state needs to support families um, in order to deliver the rights of children and young people. There is absolutely no right to use physical violence um, as part of respect for, for private and family life. Um, Article 8 of the European Convention on the Rights of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Um, the Council of Europe Convention talks about the, the respect for, for private and family life, and the state um, can only interfere with that um, in certain circumstances. But, but the European Court has been very clear, um, and all of the UN committees have been very clear, that there is no right to, to violence um, in relation to respect for, for family life. Would any of the other panel members like to address that question? I would totally agree with the Commissioner that it's a, a pretty ludicrous argument to make, especially in front of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, that, that, that children don't have rights. Um, children's rights are realised through their adults. It is, it is we who are the guardians, almost, of children's human rights. So rather than children and parents' rights being in conflict, they're actually totally complementary. And I see my role as a parent in, in making sure that I do my best to, to realise my children's rights. And as a parliament, as a society, it's our job as adults to realise children's rights. Can I ask, um, Dr Waiton, who gave his evidence uh, against the bill last week, suggested that the right to family life was about autonomy um, and that parents should have autonomy to parent their children in the way they saw fit. Um, where are the, the sort of uh, restrictions around that autonomy defined or, or are they just interpreted from this notional right to family life? 
Uh, they're, they're defined and interpreted through through a number of um, sources, both the core conventions themselves um, in relation to, if you look to to um, Article 19 of the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child makes very clear that within that parenting role that um, children need to be protected from all forms of physical um, and mental violence, um, injury, abuse, neglect, or negligent treatment, maltreatment, um, exploitation, sexual abuse, etc. And so, so it's very clearly set out in, in, the, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which is, is 30 years old. The Committee on the Rights of the Child then um, issues uh, general comments, which, which are... Uh, authoritative interpretation um, of that, and I've expanded that quite significantly in terms of making it very clear um, that um, there is no ambiguity, it is unequivocal. Children's right to protection from violence means that all forms of corporal punishment in all settings must be abolished by law, and, but also that those campaigns to, to support that must be there. So the UN Committee has been very clear both on, on the, the text of the Convention, but also in the, in the general comments um, relating to this. Uh, at the Council of Europe level, um, we have had uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe saying very much the same thing in 2008, saying that the, um, the right to respect for private and family life needs to be interpreted within the context of protecting children from all forms of violence. And in fact, um, almost all countries in Europe have, have now done this, as well as um, um, uh, a significant number, over 50, across the world. And so the idea is you have to have a comprehensive legal framework to protect children from all forms of violence in all settings, and that the um, right to respect for family life needs to be interpreted within that. And um, the European Court of Human Rights has been, been very good at this. Our domestic courts can, 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 um, can address this as well. I mean, I think, I think it is interesting to note that um, all of the le leading cases in relation to the physical punishment of children have all been against the UK, from, from corporal punishment in a criminal setting to abolishing it in, in schools, to, to focusing on, on independent schools, um, to restricting um, the use of, of an implement and other things in the home, which led to the last change in Scotland. Um, in my view, the, the current position in Scotland um, is in breach of the European standards, and, and I think um, that there is a real risk that if this bill is not passed urgently, we could end up with, again, a child having to go to, to seek redress through, through the courts. Um, my view is that um, the current position isn't compliance with with um, the European Convention as well as the, the broader framework, but but the, the court the courts are very good at in, interpreting this and the limits on respect for private and family life um, are set within the very clear guidance in relation to protecting children from violence. Before I come on to my next question, perhaps um, either Trina or Martin want to come in on either of the two topics I've just covered there. Just in relation to children's rights, more generally, um, as an organisation that has children's rights at the heart of the work we do, children, young people and families, every day that is committed to supporting, promoting and protecting children's rights, the notion that children don't have rights is, is, is a nonsense, it's ludicrous. Um, and we reject any evidence that the committee has heard thus far that suggests so. I would strongly agree with everything that's been said here today. Um, I would like to add that I don't feel there's a tension or a conflict between, you know, we've talked a lot about promoting children's rights and protecting children, but this change would actually have a positive impact on families as a whole. I think the, you know, the, the positive changes it can bring about in terms of behavioural and social norms change can benefit both parents and children in the family. And we've seen, you know, feedback and anecdotal evidence from parents that have participated in positive parenting courses and things like that, where they say the knock-on effect that it has on the whole family is of, of great benefit. OK, thank you. Um, if I may, I'd like to move on to um, the, the sort of arguments uh, that are deployed by those who oppose this bill in respect to the fact that um, the, the, there's an empirical evidence to show things like backup smacking can be an effective tool of um, parental control um, in terms of discipline. Um, the, the only, I mean, the anxiety I have about this is that um, that presupposes everybody who uses smacking does so in a proportionate and controlled manner. The last time that this parliament legislated on this issue was in 2003, and the restrictions that it put on smacking were no headshots, no shaking, and no use of implements. That's it. Do you think that those parameters have sort of set in train um, a landscape where parents understand that they have to retain control when using smacking? Um, or do you think that, uh, that, that actually it's led to more confusion. 
I think it's led to a lot of confusion. I think if you asked a parent on the street whether smacking is, is banned, they would probably say, yes, it already has been banned. I don't think there's a lot of clarity, and that's one of the things we think legal change will bring, is absolute clarity for parents, for professionals seeking to support parents, and ultimately for children about what they can, how they can expect to be, to be treated. Um, I find it very uncomfortable to talk about backup smacking. Um, I, I will, I will say, I'm not an expert in the empirical evidence, but certainly the evidence that um, Dr. Hellman um, cited in the the report that that, that we Children vs NSPC and Bernard was commissioned was really clear that there is no evidence that physical punishment is a useful discipline tool. There is no evidence that this does children any good. Um, and when we talk about backup smacking. What's the impact on the child? Does the child think, OK, that's OK, because I know it was a backup smack, it was a last resort? I don't think that's how a child would receive um, any form of physical punishment. They know that they have been hit, and, and I don't think that they would go into, you know, the, the kind of academic um, labelling um, of that. When we start to talk about backup smacking, the threat of the smack, we're drawing an invisible line in our mind about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And the problem with that is, and the problem that the law allows us to draw that invisible line, is that it is different. Everybody around this table will have a different invisible line of what's OK and what's not OK for a child to receive. And that will change as circumstances change and it sometimes will be completely blurred. And our problem with that is that the fact that our law allows that is, is, is totally unjustifiable in our mind. It should be absolutely clear to parents, to professionals and ultimately to children about how they should be treated, their, their physical dignity. Um, and then that opens up a different conversation about, um, well, how do we manage um, children's behaviour? All of the evidence from the Grown Up in Scotland study shows that um, physical punishment, there's a peak between the ages of three and five. So we're not talking about children with whom we can rationalise, who have an understanding maybe of how to regulate their emotions. We're talking about very young children here who are who don't have the, the cerebral capacity to emotionally regu regulate. We as parents need to teach them how to emotionally regulate. We ostensibly have the capacity to do that. Um, we will not model that in our children um, if our response to getting frustrated is to lash out. And um, some re re quite reasonable people in this debate are suggesting that uh, physical punishment is actually sometimes in the best interest of a child. For example, if your child is about to put its hand in a fire or run into traffic. In the 54 countries in the world um, where this has already been abolished, have we seen a decline in children's welfare in terms of people not being able to restrain their children in that way? There's absolutely not been any evidence of increased prosecutions. I don't, I can't attest to there being an increased incidence of children being knocked down or electrocuted or anything like that. But I would like to say that um, the running in front of a car or the um, going to touch the iron, going to touch the, the plug is often used in terms of this, this legislation won't let you do that. It's incumbent upon us to be absolutely clear about what this legislation is seeking to do. It is my understanding that those acts are not assault, and we're here to talk about um, removing a defence for assault. Those acts are to um, stop a child um, coming into immediate harm. I don't think, as the law currently, if we didn't mess with the law at all, I don't think the defence that we have would even come into play, because the defence speaks specifically about physical punishment. Me pulling my child out of the way of a car is not an act of physical punishment, it's an act of protection. So I think it's a red herring to focus on that as a, an example of what this legislation will seek to do. And we have a responsibility here. We know we might talk about um, public opinion not being with this piece of legislation. Uh, we need to be really clear about what this act will do and what it will not do to help garner that public opinion. And open up to the rest of the panel on any of those topics, Martin. Yeah, um, I'd just like to, going back to the original point um, that Joanna made about clarity, I think we find with the parents we work with every day, um, and I think also your general public, um, parents and what have you out in the street, the fact of the matter is that the law is not currently clear about what the law does and does not allow uh, around physical punishment. Um, one consequence of this bill will ensure that there is absolute clarity that all physical, physical punishment of any description will be prohibited by law. And I think that clarity will be really important, not only ensuring that we can provide the appropriate support to the parents that require it, but also that parents who otherwise might not seek out um, advice or help or assistance to help with issues around their parenting or um, concerns they may have around their parenting, um, that they can be encouraged to go and seek that out. Um, I'm just following on from the point that, that Joanna brought up there, um, I've heard often, similarly, the, the example cited of 
you know, use a child running out into the, the traffic, for example, or, or putting themselves in, in, in harm's way. Um, and I would absolutely echo what she said around, you know, preventing a child from doing so is, is, is not the same as, as physically punishing a child. But I think it's also important to, to recognise um, that quite often you may have to do the same or uh, to prevent a, an adult with an impairment, for example, an adult who maybe has dementia, um, from running out into or walking out into harm's way into, into the traffic. And in order to do so, you would prevent them from doing so, but you wouldn't then physically punish them afterwards to either reprimand them or, um, or, or uh, to show them that what they had done was something they shouldn't be doing. So I think the same, the same applies to children uh, as it does to adults. Um, and children learn from the example that we set. Um, our behaviour as parents in terms of uh, modelling um, is where children learn um, how to behave as they grow up. And even the slightest smack, I think, uh, indicates to a child or shows a child that uh, hitting somebody is OK. And by prohibiting physical punishment, I think we will aim to prevent that and stop that so children grow up learning that hitting people, hitting others, simply is not acceptable. Thank you. I'm going to move on now. Yeah. Um, Annie Wells, please. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, <clears throat> just following on from the last, um, the last question, if we, we know from opinion polls, we know from the submission, individual submissions we got to the committee that the public opinion isn't with the bill. So in your opinion, how do we bring the public along on this journey with us? And is, is there more about information and education rather than legislation involved? Um, just your views on that, please. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a really important point. And I suppose what, what's really clear is, is, that, is that what's really important is that we make clear exactly the point that we were just making, that what we're talking about here is, is assault. And so that's a deliberate at attack on another person for the purpose um, of, with, with, an evil, with an evil intent, which is so the intention is to cause physical injury or fear of personal injury. And so that's something that, that um, is prescribed by law unless you're the parent or carer of a child and you're doing it for the purpose of punishment and within those restrictions. So actually, that, that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about um, using physical contact with a child to keep them safe. That is not an assault and it wouldn't meet the test in terms of it being um, for the purpose of, of punishment. So we have to make that really clear. The international evidence is, is interesting in, in that in most countries that have taken the, this, um, in fact, I think in all countries that have taken this um, step as required by law and as um, strongly evidenced by all of the international evidence, the public opinion wasn't with them because generally uh, the opinion polls have said, should we criminalise good parents? Should we criminalise parents for, for smacking children? Which isn't actually the, the test that we're seeking to, um, to make the change here. Um, but what we have shown um, internationally, and there's some great evidence from, from New Zealand, which is part of the bill, kind of tracked this through, showing that um, over time, those opinions change when people saw that it, that it, that it works. And so generally um, what this has required is human rights leadership, so using the legislation to actually deliver the culture change. And actually that, that culture change takes quite a long, a long time. In New Zealand they went so far as to have a, a citizens-initiated referendum to try and reverse that change. Um, and again, the majority of people in that referendum said that they thought that the law should go back and the government at the time said, said no, this is a human rights principle, and, and that's been proven to be right, as public opinion has changed over quite a long time and, and, and fairly slowly, but without the legislation, you don't get the culture change. That's what we know to be true. You need the legislation to deliver the culture change. And, and in that way, it, it could be seen as the same as things like um, seatbelts in cars or our, our attitudes towards um, drink driving or smoking in pubs and kind of things like that, where you need to lead with the legislation in order to deliver the, the cultural change because it sets a very clear indication. It's not the prosecutions that, that change the culture, but it's the very clear indication in the law as to what, what is expected. And so what we've seen internationally is that you don't see a massive increase in, in prosecutions. Prosecutions are very, very rare. Um, you don't see an instant change in public opinion, but what you do see is a gradual change in public opinion and a culture change in relation to violence. your supplementary specifically for Bruce, the Commissioner? Uh, specifically yeah. for uh, Bruce Adamson. Uh, you uh, set out there the test for the common law uh, offence of assault. Do you think that parents who smack their children show an evil intent? I think that, so, so the evil intent's been interpreted by the courts to be an intention to cause physical injury and fear of injury. And so, so, so that, that's how, um, how, it's, how it's interpreted. Um, and so of parents when they, when they smack their children? 
that would be the way which the criminal law would approach it. So, so if that's if that isn't the intention, then it wouldn't then it wouldn't be a matter for the criminal law. Is, 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 is what we're saying. And so the criminal law is only concerns only concerns with this. So, so that's they, the so only. They have to want to. So to, they are, to so injure, they have to want to injure their child. Their or, or cause them an injury. So their intention needs to be that, and it needs to be set in the context of physical punishment as well. And so something that's not for the purpose of punishment, so that kind of grabbing um, and, and kind of restraining, um, wouldn't wouldn't concern the criminal law. Is, is what is what we're saying. What what we know is that there's an obligation to provide um, education and guidance, and all of the evidence shows that that kind of positive parenting is much much more more effective. And do you, do you, do you, sorry. For a second, Triona was wanting to come in. This just comes down to um, definitions, and the reason we use definitions is, as Bruce said, to, to differentiate between what is a, a punitive action, so a, an assault or a physical punishment, and what is a protective action. So it's the same in the definition used by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, where physical or corporal punishment is defined as a physical action that has the intent to cause some level of pain or discomfort, however light. So it's not that the parent is being malicious and that the, you know, their motivation for that is negative. It's just that the actual action that they're taking has that. I, I, I fully accept that definitions are, are very important, but we have to recognise that in Scotland, you know, the, the, the assault is a, is a common law offence, uh, and it's about how the courts in Scotland I I interpret that and interpret uh, the intention. And I, I just wonder whether, if you were looking at the ordinary or the, the reasonable person, uh, whether or not they would think that parents set out with an intention uh, to cause injury to their child. Um, and uh, 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 it's a question of, uh, you know, of interpretation. Do you think that, that, that would you be confident that the court would would see, uh, would would see that action as intending to cause uh, an injury? I, I think that, I think the courts are, are very good in interpreting this. And I mean, we have we have we have the law of assault in relation to to, to adults at, um, at, at the moment. And 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 then these things generally don't get to court. I, I would I would think it would be would be. Um, I, I can't. I can't really foresee a matter ending up in courts for the the, the type of um, small physical intervention that, that that you're talking about. This wouldn't wouldn't get to get to the courts. What what this is about is setting a very clear standard that any form of physical violence for the purpose of of, of punishment, using pain um, as as a, a tool of punishment, um, is wrong. Um, but. For the criminal law to get engaged with it, the, the standard would be in relation to to assault. Yeah. Um, and that would require this intention. But do you do you recognise that the, the vagaries of the law and definitions create could create a grey area, um, if not if you know if, if not more carefully defined? That's, cert that's certainly not the experience anywhere else, and, and it's not not the experience at, at, at the moment with, within Scotland. I think in terms of we've we've got a long history of of, okay. of um, the police and the procurator fiscal and the courts being able to, to interpret our laws. This is this isn't this isn't this isn't a new type of offence. This is something that the courts are already very very okay. aware of. So. Right. Thank you. I'm conscious, Oliver. That was a short supplementary, <laughs> and we cut in on on Annie Wells. Annie, apologies. Um, so if anyone else has got anything else to, to sort of add to my question, how do we bring the public on the on this journey? Um, I think we should accept, we need to accept, this is a really emotive issue. It speaks to how we were parented, it speaks to how we parent. So there are, um, there's not universal consensus about this, I think it's fair to say. Um, as, uh, as the Commissioner said, most examples elsewhere in the world have brought this piece of legislation, legislation in um, in the face of um, some some public opposition, um, because it was the right thing to do, I think some of the polls that are cited, um, actually, if you interrogate them, so the Comres poll that's often cited about um, over a thousand people and, and whatever the result was, actually, if you disaggregate that in terms of age, there's <coughs> a huge disparity. So older people are more likely not to support this bill, and younger people overwhelmingly are. Um, and we also need to look at the views of children and young people. Um, and the Scottish Youth Parliament have put before us, in terms of their work, overwhelming statements from tens of thousands of young people in Scotland who say that this is absolutely something um, that, that we should do. So actually, I think that there, as we see in terms of the decline in the use of physical punishment anyway, um, younger people are more likely to support this legislation. And actually, they are the parents of now and they are the parents of, of, of the future. So I think while we, while we know that there is not a universal support for this, there is increasing support from, from younger generations. And I think it's just important to acknowledge that. Um, and in terms of your question, should it be public education or, or should it be legislation? 
absolutely it has to be both and all of the evidence says it's both this law change in itself will not will not seek the behavior will not achieve the behavior change and the, and the cultural change we want to see it has to be both we can't change the law without telling people about it and and, and sustained public information and, and awareness campaigns not just a one-off but equally um, those public education campaigns won't do it either I just, first of all, largely agree with, with everything that Bruce and Joanna have already said. I think as we see it, the, the legislating is just one part of a much wider approach, and that does include um, a public information campaign, awareness raising, information available to parents, families, children and young people through multiple uh, channels and, uh, and formats. Um, a third element, I would say, would be ensuring the provision of accessible support information, advice and help for all parents that might require it um, in order to ensure that parents who may, be, uh, who may feel that they need help or support with their parenting, um, particularly in light of this legislation, um, can go out there confidently and know that they can find um, that help, support and advice that they need. So I would say there's, there's, there's three elements to it, but legislating is absolutely key. And I think also um, I would say that your role committee members and your, your colleagues in Parliament um, as legislators and policy makers is to legislate in the best interests of your constituents um, and of society more widely. Um, and that should be from an informed, evidence-based point of view. And while it is important to be aware of and to take note of public opinion, public opinion shouldn't outweigh the evidence base where there is a strong robust evidence base and I think in relation to this particular issue and in relation to this particular bill there's a very strong and robust evidence base in favour of prohibiting physical punishment of children. John, I was wanting to come. Thank you. Yeah, um, just wanted to add that there is also the you know, responsibility on government and parliament to protect the human rights of all of its citizens and that includes children um, and sometimes the protecting the rights of a minority can require that sort of top-down approach uh, particularly where it is as we've said, you know, evidence-based and supported by guidance from international rights bodies as well as international um, sort of health and medical bodies, including the World Health Organization and others. Um, also, I think it's worth noting that most parents don't particularly want to use physical punishment. You know, they, they don't like doing it and they don't feel good after it. Um, the UNICEF MIX programme, um, which covers a whole range of issues, including uh, violent discipline, and they've conducted surveys in countries all over the world, they've consistently found that the use of corporal punishment is far higher than the number of parents and carers who believe it's necessary um, to raise a child properly. So I think what's encouraging about that is it implies that parents would use alternative methods if they were more aware of them, more comfortable with them and had more confidence in them. Um, so I think there's a responsibility there to meet those needs and fill that gap, um, which this bill would go a long way towards doing, um, particularly and as we've said, providing the clarity. And I think it's that clarity in the law that's so essential as a foundation to do all of the work around education and parent support, because without it, it leaves that ambiguity, it leaves the confusion. Um, and the assumption is often that if the law allows it, then it must be okay. Um, so we've seen already in Ireland following a similar change there that one of the greatest benefits has been the clarity provided to the police and particularly to social services and all uh, people working with and for families um, that they can say absolutely never physical punishment, um, not acceptable and so let's instead talk about the positive things that you can be doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, and, and good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, um, the, the, the published evidence that there's been that, that physical punishment of children can cause long-term harm. It's been linked to both um, further childhood aggression, adult aggression and antisocial behaviour. Is that something that you agree with? And if you do agree with it, could you perhaps give us a bit of a, an example of, of why you have that view? Um. Yes, I think there's a huge body of evidence that uh, supports that. Um, the Global Initiative did uh, prepared a summary of that research in 2016, and at that point, there were over 250 studies um, that 
showed associations with between experience of child um, corporal punishment and the wide range of negative health and behavioural outcomes that you've uh, mentioned. I think you know the research continues to be published since then. Um, so there's just an enormous body of evidence supporting that, and there is no comparable body of evidence um, that goes against it. Okay, thank you. I think there was, there, was, there was very strong evidence last week from, from some academics or auth authors of, of some of the, um, the papers in, in Scotland and some of the, the reviews. I think the, the evidence base is, is growing and is very consistent in terms of, um, in terms of the negative impacts of, of early experience of violence and, and of physical punishment. Um, and just on um, a Tuesday this week, the special representative to the Secretary General um, on Violence Against Children gave her report to the, the Human Rights Council and, and highlighted a number of other reports as well. And so this was something discussed early this week at, at the United Nations Human Rights Council. And um, Marta Santos Payos, the, the um, special representative, was very clear um, in relation to welcoming this bill in Scotland and saying that she thought that the, the evidence was, was now so strong um, that, that, that all countries need to do this as a matter of um, a matter of, um, of urgency and also linked it to the sustainable development goals and particularly goal, goal 16 too and that link to, to health and development and, and, and the idea that this is going to play a, a really strong role in terms of the, the lifelong development of, of children and young people and that very clear link to, to between experience of violence and, and ongoing, um, ongoing ability to, to access rights um, across the board. Okay, do any of the other panel members want to comment? I think it's important to say that well, I'm going to speak for the panel, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Nobody is suggesting that that link is causal, that because you have been physically punished, you will mm. um, experience X, Y, Z. Because I think, again, in all the nuances, that can be lost. We are not for one minute suggesting that experiencing physical punishment will mean that you will go on to do X, Y, Z. Um, but the evidence shows such a serious link, such a strong link, consistent link, that um, it undermines what we have in our statute books at present and makes this a really urgent change. OK. Martin, um, only just to say that, again, I agree with what the panel members have said already. I think there's a significant, robust evidence base, as Bruce mentioned last week, you heard from some academics who've published papers, who've conducted studies, who are far more qualified than perhaps I am, uh, to, to comment on, um, on what those long-term outcomes are. Um, I think just talking to some of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of family support and parenting support, we see some of the direct uh, impact and consequences of what some of that work can achieve. Um, all the work we've done with families over the years um, has shown that through addressing the underlying issues for parents uh, around things like mental health, for example, um, and other factors that may um, affect their parenting capacity, um, and the earlier we intervene, um, that uh, we can with confidence say that we can improve, um, improve parents' capacity, but not also improve capacity, but improve relationships with their children by role modelling, demonstrating good behaviours, providing opportunities for stay and play, uh, building routines in an effective way, working through sleep routines. All these are things that contribute to be able to build and develop positive uh, relationships between parents and their children. And we know the outcomes. We've already heard much evidence about the outcomes of what that can do, positive relationships and how it can impact on children's well-being long term. Um, so we can say with some confidence in terms of the work we do day to day that we see the impact of that with families we work with. Okay, thank you for that. Are, are the panel aware of any specific equality groups that are more likely to be subjected to physical punishment? For example, children perhaps with additional support needs um, or, or physical um, disabilities. Are, are any specific groups more likely to be subjected to this? I think there's um, research that certainly shows children with disabilities can be at a heightened vulnerability of violence generally, including physical punishment. Um, beyond that, I think um, you know there are differences maybe in how it can be applied. Sometimes it can be used for different reasons or in a different way for boys or girls. Um, I think that's... Mm, okay. Bruce, I don't know, did you want to comment? I'd only to say that, that um, yeah, that there, are, there are studies that look at kind of gender and disability and, 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 and things. Um, and I'm not an expert on them, but, but this is a universal protection that, that, that we're looking for um, and or that, that's, that's required. So no child 
um, should should be subject to to physical violence. Um, and uh, some children, particularly those that, that um, have additional communication needs, um, are, at, are at heightened risk. And so um, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the studies that, that, that suggest that they, um, they are more likely to be, to be um, assaulted, mm -hmm. but um, they are at heightened risk and have less ability to, um, to express themselves um, or to seek justice. Um, if they if they are subject to that, and that links strongly to the the work on restraint and seclusion that, that my office has done in relation to educational mm -hmm. settings, um, which which show that that's much more likely to happen in relation to um, to children with communication additional support and additional support needs. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's not what we're discussing within the context of this Just of this bill. No. But this is a universal principle. So so the, the key the key thing is that no child should right. and the additional protections we need to put in place mm -hmm. for for um, for particular children need to be looked at as well. But um, but I'm not I'm not an expert on the on the evidence around equality issues there. Okay. Can I ask the panel then about restraint? Restraint was an issue that um, I, I raised last week, and I'd be interested if, if pan the panel thinks that restraint should be something that's covered with this um, particular piece of legislation. And restraint is more commonly used in, in residential care settings. And, and as someone, as I said last week, as someone that has seen restraint being used, it, it can be quite um, shocking and alarming to see restraint being used on, on a young person. And, and there is almost a fine line between restraint being used to prevent um, um, someone causing further harm to themselves or, or others and actually punishing and harming them through restraint. But restraint can be used in the residential care setting, but it could potentially also be used by um, carers who are caring for um, a, a young person with perhaps quite complex um, behavioural needs. So I'd be interested in your view in whether there is a way that this legislation could protect young people fr from the use of restraint. As I said, th this, this broader issue is something that, that, I'm, that I'm particularly concerned um, about, and um, I recently conducted an investigation into, into the use of restraint and seclusion in, um, in educational settings, which was laid before the Parliament last year, and I, I would very much welcome the opportunity to come and speak to the committee about that and the recommendations in that. I think the evidence from, from Who Cares and the um, conversations that we have with care experienced young people raise this as a, a very significant concern which needs to be addressed. The place for that is not, in my view, within this legislation, though. Um, and I think that uh, partly that's, that's because um, within a residential or educational setting at the moment, um, you wouldn't be able to rely on this defence um, because um, in, a, in an institutional setting, um, you're, you're not exercising, even, even if you're exercising those parental responsibilities, mm -hmm. you'd be excluded from this legislation. So, so this point, actually, this legislation um, isn't really about that. And I think that we would be much better to look at restraint and seclusion um, in a separate in a separate setting and look to see what what legislation, policy, and practice changes need to be made. A number of which contained within my my report, but also the work that um, that, that Who Cares Scotland um, have been doing. So, so I think I think this is it's an issue that urgently needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that it sits within within the context of this legislation, which is specifically looking at the use of uh, assaults for the purpose of, of physical punishment and whether that can be can be justified when exercised by by parents or carers in relation to children. So so I, so I, 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 I agree very strongly that we need to take action mm -hmm. in relation to, to restraint and, and seclusion. But but in my view, this bill wouldn't be the place to do it. OK, thank you for that. Does any of the other panel members want to comment? I'm conscious that we're, we're marching on. So if, if you have a different opinion, it would be good to hear it. But if it's, if it's agreeing, we'll maybe, we'll maybe move on to the next. Simply, simply to say that, well, I do absolutely so do agree. Ag agree with okay. Bruce, but also just to say as a provider of residential child care and restraint obviously being uh, something that is uh, significant in relation to, to the work we do, working with looked after children, um, we would also welcome the opportunity to come and speak to the committee um, at any future point to talk about the issue of restraints as it is an important issue, but I don't think it's now is the right time in terms of this bill. Okay, thank you. Um, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, I, convener. I wondered, um, last week in evidence, uh, we heard the suggestion that this uh, legislation uh, won't see um, an increase in prosecutions or fines. Is, is that correct? It hasn't been the experience in, in other countries. The, 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 the increases have been, have been nominal. Um, in, in New Zealand, for example, over the 10-year kind of period, I think there were kind of eight, eight cases, and actually some of those would have probably been prosecuted, um, would, have, would, have, um, would uh, have already fallen foul of the law in Scotland anyway. 
um, the, the numbers of cases of, of kind of intervention being needed um, in terms of prosecution or, or court were, were, were very low. And in fact, um, when there was intervention that fell short of prosecution, it tended not to be based on kind of fines or, or criminal diversion. It tended to be based on um, putting in place additional additional support. So what I would see would be um, a need, and I think it's set out in the financial memorandum, um, for increased resource to be put into support services for families. Um, and so I, so I certainly think that, that this would um, allow us to, to put more support in place. I, I wouldn't foresee a significant increase in, in prosecution or, or, or other criminal um, responses to, um, to behaviour that's not already covered by the, by the current legislation. Is that the same for the rest of the panel? You don't need to give a sort of long answer if that's the case, but if you've got... Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Could I just give a quick specific example um, so from Sweden? They, there was a study done in 2000 which examined the impact that the ban had had there um, and that found that actually it had been effective in um, providing opportunities for increased early intervention um, and early identification of children and families at risk of violence and providing um, increased support to families. So it saw a decline um, by a third in the amount of uh, interventions that required out-of-home care as well as uh, a whole range of other positive benefits. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and the f uh, final question um, I really want to ask is um, whether, whether you think the way this particular bill is drafted uh, and you know, the particular uh, style of it is the correct way to, to, to legislate in this area um, or you know, if there's an opportunity to do something more uh, comprehensive uh, that, that set out in more more detail and clarity uh, you know, what, what, what our uh, aspirations were. I think we totally support how the how the bill is drafted. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner, but our part of our international or human rights obligations is to remove any permission of, of violence against children from our legislation. And this is it. This is what we have. So we have a defence from the common law of assault and we need to um, remove that. Um, we are not alone in, in relying on the common law. That's the change that Ireland made in 2015 or 14. That is the change I understand that uh, the Welsh Government is seeking to make as well because their legislation very much mirrors our own. Um, the culture change takes a while, so it might be that in, if, we, if we pass this piece of legislation, we might revisit this at a, a, a different point and think actually more needs to be done. But where we are right now, I think this is absolutely um, the, the, the repeal that we need to make. And do you, do you think that the legislation amounts to, to a ban on smacking? This is where we need to be absolutely clear. There is no offence being created in this piece of legislation. This legislation removes a defence that if a, a parent is charged with assault and the Crown Office has deemed that there is sufficient evidence and that it's in the public interest to prosecute that parent, that there, at that point there should be no relying on a defence because that, that the young person that they assaulted ostensibly is a child. There is no offence in this legislation and we need to be absolutely so clear about that. So this is not that. a ban on smacking? Is that correct? The impact of this piece of legislation is hoped to be behaviour change that would result in a lessening of the use of physical punishment. Black and white, that is not what this piece of legis legislation is doing. It is repealing a defence against assault. Okay. And do you, do, you, do you think that that's ambitious enough, uh, Mr Adamson, or do you think that you know, we, we should be setting out in, in law uh, our, our intention to make violence against children you know, an offence? Uh, first, firstly, I agree with, with everything that that, um, that Joanne has just said in terms of I think that was that was that was a very good ex explanation of it. Um, I think what what is really clear is is that I think that this bill is is drafted very simply and correctly to address the, um, the 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 failure in our law to protect children's rights in relation to the current defence. Um, there's lots of other things that we need to do to make sure that, that, that children um, live free from violence, and a lot of that's to do, to do with, with education. But I think this is the correct approach, and this is generally the approach that's been, that's been taken, is to remove that defence to make sure that there's a comprehensive, comprehensive protection. Um, the, the law as it stands knows what assault is, and, um, and so that's what we, that's what we need to, to address. I, I think that there, um, there could be further complications in trying to, to overcomplicate it and kind of take, a, take a different approach. Thank you. Thank you. Fulton McEgar. Yeah, good morning, uh, panel. Uh, I think that the concerns that's been expressed by my, my colleagues uh, to my right here, uh, both at today's uh, uh, session and, and last week, is about the, the possible criminalisation of, of parents for 
uh, what they would deem just now as, as, as being good parenting. I don't share that concern as it happens, uh, and I think some of the evidence I've heard today has been, been really, really um, quite powerful, actually. But I'm, I'm wondering, actually, in, you know, as a, as a previous social worker myself, and, and I know that uh, you'll all have experience um, uh, in this field, actually it's quite it's quite difficult to get prosecutions for quite serious and heinous crimes against children. Um, so I, I don't actually think that this is this is the purpose of this legislation or that it will lead to, to some sort of uh, criminalisation of parents for what would be seen as a lesser offence from what uh, I've, I've maybe alluded to there. Do you think, though, that, the, um, that, that by bringing in this legislation it can actually help, uh, firstly, bring clarity to the laws you've talked about, but also help actually and protect children throughout a whole range of um, things that can happen to them. I think this issue speaks a lot to the status of the child and how the child is viewed by society. Um, and I think this bill could mark a turning point um, and a significant step in, in moving from a more dominant and uh, viewpoint of children as possessions and property of parents to uh, a more progressive view of uh, children as full rights holders um, and entitled to their full range of rights. And we have seen in some countries that have implemented uh, similar legislation that it has had a positive knock-on effect um, in advancing children's rights generally. For example, um, in Austria, where um, a ban was implemented in 1989, a uh, survey was conducted in 2014, which was 25 years after uh, the legislation was passed. And that found, they put the same statements to, um, I think it was over 50, people over 15 years of age, that had been put to them in 77. And while it showed um, a significant decrease in support for physical punishment, there was also a statement put that... Um, when an adult is speaking, children should remain silent or something along those lines. And there was um, a really significant decrease in support for that statement as well. So I think it went from 64% uh, support in 77 to about 16% in 2014. And I think that shows that change as well and the, the shifting attitudes that this can, can bring about in terms of how we view children and their other rights in terms of participation and to be heard. I think we would agree that this um, would better protect um, children because of that invisible line I talked about earlier. Um, children are at increased risk of harm. Um, because of, of, of where we've drawn the line in our legislation. I think this would provide absolute clarity for the professionals who are seeking to help families because it's, it's tricky territory for them at the minute. So if a health visitor is going into a home, for example, and the parent says, you know, is it OK? You can't really answer that very equivocably. equivocably. Um, it's a kind of value judgment at the moment. Well, not really, but... Um, this would provide that absolute clarity and, and would, would draw a solid line, I suppose, in terms of what's acceptable and what's not. And the other thing that I would point to is the, the overwhelming evidence that countries which have changed their legislation have seen um, a significant decrease in injurious, severe um, child maltreatment, um, which is not principally the purpose of this, but it shows that there is a correlation there between creating that absolute clarity and actually being able to reduce more serious abuse. I think that um, that's been answered very well. I'm happy in the interest of time to leave it there. Gail Ross. Thank you. Vino, good morning, panel, and thank you for your evidence so far. Um, it's been mentioned a few times that the countries that have already introduced this have um, not seen any increase in prosecution. And one of the concerns that we've heard is that there might be an increased burden on public services in a financial sense. Would you say that that concern is founded or would you say that um, it's maybe not a reasonable concern? Um, I think the evidence from other country is, is that um, while, while this um, may lead to um, additional costs, though, those are very good economic decisions. Early intervention works. And so, and so while we would possibly expect to see that, that there um, may be an increase in early interventions with family, we know the economic benefit of that um, is, is, is exponential in relation to the, um, to, to, to the money spent. So, so I, I, I think actually there, there, is, um, there is a need for us to put more money into early intervention services. We know, we know that as well. We know, we, we know that it works. And so if this bill helps that, 
then, that, then that's an additional thing which is useful. And what we've seen in the international evidence is that those early interventions work very well and that they're economic good sense as well as respecting the rights of children and young people because those, those types of early interventions to give families and parents the support that they need for positive parenting actually delivers much, much better results. Um, and those results can be seen in the health system and in the education system. And, and, and so, so I think that, that that's really important that, that any additional cost would, would be a cost well spent. So you would actually class any money that had to be spent as a result of this bill as preventive spend? Yes. Okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah, um, I would just like to absolutely agree with everything that Bruce has just said there about what we know about early support and, and particularly um, where any resource that goes into providing any additional support as a result of this bill could be quite clearly demonstrated to be preventative spend in, in, in that way. I think what we know is early support works, working with families as early as possible, families who need additional help, support, advice, information, it works, it has positive outcomes and it prevents much uh, uh, worse consequences uh, in the future for families and for their children. Um, and I think it fits quite firmly into you know, our current childcare policy framework in relation to getting it right for every child. It's about working with families as early as possible. It's all part of the early intervention agenda. And I think any additional support that's required as a result of this bill can, uh, can be seen in that context. Um, I want to have a wee look at the um, financial memorandum and the Scottish Government's estimate of £20,000 to support this, um, we have heard that is perhaps not sufficient and I know that um, there has been various um, written evidence that you've given about that um, aspect. If we're talking about preventive spend, if we're talking about awareness raising, if we're talking about positive parenting courses and everything else that goes along with that, um, I heard in one of my other committees just this week that a six-week campaign for awareness raising and a change in the law could cost anything up to half a million pounds. So do you think that the financial memorandum is accurate? And if not, what do you think needs to be added to that? And where do you think that this money um, should come from? Because obviously, Bruce, you said that it crosses a lot more portfolios than just the one that we're looking at here. Um, I think that the, the, the key thing for me is that the educative work should be done anyway, regardless of this thing. Um, Article 19.2 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child says very clearly the state's got an obligation to do all of this, this um, promotion and support um, anyway. And so actually, even if this bill wasn't happening, um, that work should be done. It should be in the budget. It should, should be set out for. So linking it, link it to this bill and the financial memorandum of, of, of the bill, I think, I think is um, perhaps not the right way of looking at it um, in terms of this is an obligation on government anyway and so actually we should be seeing that that spend allocated and a rights-based approach to budgeting would have um, would have, would have um, highlighted that very very clearly that, that more work needs to be done so I, I wouldn't necessarily see it as, a, as a, a criticism of the financial memorandum of the bill we do need to put more money into this absolutely um, but yeah, I wouldn't say this is direct criticism of, of the financial memorandum of, of this bill because it's not actually a consequential change. Um, it's actually something we should have been doing anyway and, and because we know that it works and it's a requirement. Um, yeah, um, I'm not a marketeer, so I have no idea how much these kind of things cost, um, but only to say that they ha it has to happen if this law changes ha um, happens and it should be sustained. So that's just, as I said earlier, so this shouldn't be a one-off by the way the laws change. This should be consistent me messages about, about positive parenting. And we've got a range of so resources already. I mean, we have um, parent, every parent receives the Ready Steady Baby and then there's a kind of toddler edition. We have health visitors who at a minimum go into families, I think it's eight times. These messages should be communicated through our existing resources as much as any additional resources. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Um, not an expert on marketing or cost of marketing, but I think there was evidence last week given comparisons between previous uh, public information campaigns around the smoking ban, for example, and how much was spent on that versus what's outlined in the financial memorandum. Um, I think utilising the existing and available resources, as John has just, just outlined, is, 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 is absolutely sensible um, and, and would help to achieve what we're trying to achieve in terms of public information and public messaging. And I think also that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't necessarily um, think that we shouldn't be um, implementing all the things we need to do to achieve what this bill hopes to achieve simply because it's unaffordable or it costs too much. As far as I'm concerned, protecting children uh, should never be unaffordable. Um, and so I don't really see that as an argument that we, we shouldn't be commencing with this bill. Thanks.
questions. Okay, we have a um, couple of minutes left um, for this panel. I wonder if um, Gordon Linders, did you want to come in with something? Um, a quick question to Bruce Adamson. Are you familiar with the non-fatal offences against the Person Act 1997 from Ireland? No. Um, because you suggested that what we're doing is the same as they did in Ireland, but actually assault is um, defined in, in that act. So there they didn't fall back in the common law. So are you saying you haven't looked at the law in Ireland? No, sorry, that, that, was, was that wasn't my suggestion. It wasn't me that said that. But um, ask that you speak through the chair uh, as well, please. Yeah, sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't me that said that. Yeah, but, but would you agree? I mean, everyone seems to agree the law should be clear. Yes, the, the, law, the law should cer the, certainly be, be clear, but I'm not sure, is there a suggestion that the current law of assault in Scotland is, is not clear? I mean, this, the, this, this would seem to me an argument about... Well, the common, the common law is unclear, yeah. and can you name one country where it wasn't, this issue was not dealt with by way of an act of Parliament defining the circumstances? It, well, including, including New Zealand under the Crimes Act 1961, Section 59, where it's set out in detail. Well, I think the thing in, in New Zealand is that we codified the criminal law, and so, yes. so, so if, this, if this is an argument about codifying the criminal law generally, then, then I think that that could be something that, that, the, that we could look at, is how we could make the, make the, the common law more clear, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm confused as to the suggestion that the, the current criminal system and the common law isn't clear, because the, this wouldn't be about this offence specifically, but this would seem to be an argument that we should codify all, all common, common law in relation to criminal matters. This isn't any different from any other element of the common law, and in Scotland we're, we're very used to dealing with that. But, but um, the common law provides defences, for example, self-defence for an adult who assaults another adult, or this sort of defence. So if we're changing the defence, we're changing the common law. And in other countries, including common law jurisdictions like New Zealand, like Ireland, they did it by setting it out clearly in statute. But they, they, they did it when they codified the common law, as you say, in, in 1961, or actually previously. New Zealand's always had that kind of tradition. It, it wasn't a change that was made through... through um, through the Crime Substitute Section 59 Amendment, Amendment Act, that, that, didn't, that didn't codify the law in relation to assault. That had already been, been so done. So this would be a good place to start making the law clear in that way, as I, I, it is in other jurisdictions. I, I, I think that if, if we were going to look at codifying the whole criminal law, that would be a matter for, for the Law Commission to no, look just, at and others. this offence. First, Mr Linthurst, as a courtesy visiting MSPs get to question the panel, but you need to do it in the same manner as everyone else. So through the chair, please. Thank you, convener. Um, um, and so uh, I think that if, if this was a discussion around um, providing additional clarity to the common law by codifying it more generally, that would be a massive piece of work. And I, and I don't think that there is an issue at the moment with lack of clarity within the common law. We're very, very used to understanding it. And I think choosing one specific um, change here um, and, and opening that up into codifying the criminal law um, is 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 not is not the right right way to way to approach it, and I think some of the things within the within within section fifty nine of the New, New Zealand law, which you'd mentioned, um, have very kind of um, questionable legal effect in, in terms of relation to um, discretion to prosecution, which was was considered. Um, if if we look at um, section fifty nine. For, for example, the first three words are to avoid doubt. This was put in as a political compromise, just to just to um, to uh, reaffirm existing existing practice, but. Generally, in, in, in New Zealand, while we have um, the codified, codified codification of some criminal law, it's, it's only to the extent that we already understand in relation to, to common law here. It only sets out exactly the same test that we already know and understand and, and is applied every day by, by courts in Scotland. Mr Finney, do you wish to yeah. ask any questions? Yes, thank you, Convener. OK. In which case, um, thank you, panel, for your evidence this morning. We'll suspend briefly to change panels.
OK, welcome back, everybody. Um, our second panel are here. You're all very welcome. Um, Amy Johnston, Policy Officer, Zero Tolerance. Alison Davis, Chief Executive Officer, Sahelia. Maureen Phillip, who is the Senior Family Support Director at PAMIS. Nora Urig, Senior Associate, Equality and Human Rights Commission. And Lucy Chetty, Head Teacher, New Struan School, who's here on behalf of Scottish Autism. Um, if I may ask you the same question I asked the first panel, do you support the Bill's aims of stopping physical punishment of children in Scotland? Lucy. Yes, I do support the, the Bill's aims. I think it, um, Bruce had, had talked about the awareness that that would give in terms of uh, support coming into families and a proactive approach to enabling that. And I think any awareness to raise that agenda is a positive thing. Uh, yes, we agree and fully support the spirit of the, of the proposed legislation, but we're very concerned about the possible impacts of the implementation. Okay. Maureen. Yes, PAMIS very much supports this, um, this bill, and um, fa quite frankly, for our families, it's a lifeline. Okay, thank you. Nora. Um, yes, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, supports this bill, and we are of the opinion that children deserve um, more protection and not just equal protection um, in terms of assault okay, thank as you. adults. Good Amy. morning, and thank you for the opportunity to give evidence today. Um, we warmly welcome the bill. Um, especially the aim to end um, the physical punishment of children and believe that it will send out positive messages around respect, responsible use of authority, healthy relationships and tackling violence within the family and society as a whole. Zero Tolerance works to prevent violence against women and girls and our core position is that everybody has the right to live without the fear of violence. Physical punishment of children is part of a wider continuum of violence within our society and ending um, the justification and the normalisation of this physical punishment will help reinforce the attitude that violence is never okay in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Alex. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. I'll try to be a lot briefer in my questioning uh, to let others in. Um, but I'd like to go back to the same question I asked the last panel. Um, there is, we've had conflicting views about whether there exists in international law, treaties and conventions to which this state is a signatory, a tension between children's rights and family rights, the rights to family life. Um, do you recognise that tension? Do children have rights? And if there is a right, a conflicting right, which allows parents to physical, uh, physically punish their children, are you aware where that exists in international law? Would like to come in on that. Um, I mean, I would just repeat everything that Bruce said in terms of that. Um, it's very, very clear that children have rights, um, not just on an international level in terms of the UN conventions and particularly the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also on a European level. And within Scotland, we recognise that as well. Um, so in terms of the tension between other rights, particularly the right to family life. Um, again, international law or human rights law is very clear. Um, it's about the best interest of the child. And you can have your right to family life, but that doesn't include your right to use um, physical punishment. Does anyone else wish to Yes. Sahelia works with women um, who are, have no points of contact with the mainstream community. Uh, they've got very different views on parenting. They've got very different uh, cultural contexts of family life. Uh, there's no understanding, or very rarely an understanding, that children have any human rights. Uh, we've worked with um, 1,180 women in the past year in 14 different languages, as 763 of those women have been from FGM-affected communities and are survivors themselves. We're looking at situations where there is no understanding that something as severe as FGM is illegal, never mind smacking a child. We've got levels of severe multiple trauma which isn't being supported or looked after. Um, and what we're seeing is quite a punitive approach um, from social work. Health visitors frequently don't know what to do. I have to put in the room that Sahelia works with women who are unable to access mainstream services, and that's generally due to uh, language skills, limited confidence, mental health problems, especially very severe trauma. Um, so, But I, I believe that if we're supporting them, getting it right for the most vulnerable, then we've got it right for everybody. Uh, 
Sir Healy are fully, fully endorses the, the spirit of the bill, but we are concerned about the implementation, unless there's some kind of um, support for parenting and going in to support, especially lone women who are left, left alone with children. Frequently, in the case of Sahelia Glasgow, uh, children are a uh, result of rape. Uh, trauma provides barriers against positive parenting anyway. And the whole mix is very dangerous for children. Uh, but to take a punitive approach uh, to the families, to the mothers specifically, uh, doesn't work. It criminalises uh, women, um, puts pressure onto women who are already suffering, already surviving violence. And what we need to be doing is, is providing a lot more support. Somebody had a figure of £20,000. We would need that for one month for language support if we were to reach the women, just the ones we work with, and provide wraparound parenting support. We provide when resources allow it, parenting support, we do it in six languages, and other support we provide in six, uh, in 14 languages. Uh, but that has to be done in a concerted way. And maybe the Home Office could be um, persuaded to hand over some of the increasing fees that they're gathering from um, asylum-seeking and uh, migrant communities to actually provide that kind of learning and support in a culturally aware and trauma-informed way. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to come in? Or I was just going to add from the perspective of Scottish autism and, and we would always advocate the rights of the child but that wraparound support for families is vital. Often the families that we're working with are at a point of crisis and the level of stress that our parents are feeling um, contributes into how they're able to cope and manage and how their resilience is. So whilst the, the rights of the child is, is absolutely paramount, it, it needs to come with the support around the family too. Okay, we've also had a bit of a discussion about whether the current laws around smacking or physical punishment of any kind are clear. The last time that we legislated was in 2003, which gave the limitations I described in the original panel of uh, no headshots, shaking or implements. Um, do you, from your, the experience of your organisations, are families and parents aware of where the lines are drawn? Are they sufficient and uh, do they... Uh, lend themselves to the deployment of physical punishment with control in every case? Uh, no, not at all, because there's no points of integration with the families that we work with. They, they don't know what to do. They're told that smacking is wrong and they can't smack children here, and we, um, but they don't know what else to do. So children end up not being parented. Uh, parents are frightened of what's going to happen. Uh, and then children are put in a position where they do get hit and they get hit very hard um, and then they get told not to tell anybody, which is a, a double abuse. Um, our position is that the combination of the 2003 restrictions and also some grey area around what is justifiable makes it, there's two points of ambiguity here, um, which is very difficult for parents and families to navigate and also for children themselves to understand what's okay. Um, we would expand that out to society as a whole. The idea that some forms of, of um, assault, especially to the most vulnerable, and inflicting pain as a form of behaviour management is justifiable is a very confusing message and is, sits in opposition to a lot of our other messages around um, combating violence against women in society through Equally Safe, for example. So I think there's a lack of clarity for families and children and also for society more generally. Can I just back up a little bit and answer the question as well about the right to family life in this as well? Because I think it's quite relevant, the whole thing. For the people that I support look after children who have got profound and multiple learning disabilities, so they're non-verbal, um, and often they've got significant health care needs. So for these families, they have to... They, they use the word fight a lot. Um, and for them, I think they do have a right to family life without having to fight every day for cases. I mean, I spend my life supporting families who have been submitted to the mo their children have been submit submitted to quite horrific assaults, both physical and um, sexual, actually. And what they say, we've got the fantastic policies that we've got in child protection, we've got the GERVEC in the schools, but still, that abuse, abuse is happening, and that's why I'm saying that for th this bill is a lifeline, because what these families' children are subjected to is assault. And uh, what they say to me on a regular basis is, with the current legislation, um, the practice of that 
when it's put into practice, for them it's not working often because they, what they say, and I'll be very honest here, they say we need a sign above the door for our children saying, just help yourself. You know, so that's quite profound. So for us, this bill, um, justice is a lifeline because it means that they do have the right to family life and if they say their child's assaulted, somebody through this bill will now have to listen. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Annie Wells now. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning, panel. Um, just the, the same sort of a question I asked in the, the last panel. We've seen through opinion polls, we've seen through the submissions, the individual submissions to the committee on, on this, um, the bill. The general public aren't with the bill. How do we go about bringing the general public with us? How do we go about um, just bringing them on this journey with us? Because it's, it is increasingly that parents see this as a ban on smacking. And I personally, assault on any child is wrong if, if that is what it is. But parents are seeing it as a ban on smacking. And how do we bring parents on the journey to say that isn't what the bill is? Um, I think fundamentally most parents really want to do what's best for their child and what's best for their family, but they also don't have the time to sit and read Equally Protected or Dr Heilman's work. So th there's a job of work around making that accessible for parents and sharing what we've learned around the harms that um, corporal punishment causes, because we know that the, the huge balance of evidence finds that it's very little, like it's not, it's not effective and it's, it's very harmful. So there's, there's a lot of work around working with, with the public to to have these conversations and engaging with them around this, both through associated um, public campaigns, but through separate work as well. Um, I think, and I know that Joanna touched on this in the earlier panel, but we do know that um, children's opinions sit very differently around this issue. 82% of young people responding to the 2016 Scottish Youth Parliament consultation agreed that all physical assault against children should be illegal. So I think there's a big role for children's voices to be heard as part of this. Um, and that opinion change is already happening. If we, if we look over time, we're slowly changing our, our positions on this. Um, the Growing Up in Scotland study in the Ipsos Mori poll found that the declining number of parents say they have smacked their child with a younger population group more in favour of abandoning smacking altogether. Um, so it's about having, you know, this, this, this opinion, we, our position is that this opinion is changing and that the um, legislation can reflect this as a great opportunity in Scotland at the moment. Um, and we know that smacking doesn't work, just like we now know that smoking is harmful. So there's, there's a lot of public awareness around that and we think children's voices should be at the centre of it. Anything? It's a very good question. I would add perhaps that the, the, the trust and the relationship building with families is where we see a huge amount of change. Um, and, and that's where I think the, the focus needs to be, which is the individual work that people are doing, families on the ground, to help um, parents understand better ways to, to manage and cope. Just a, a very quick supplementary. So the financial memorandum says £20,000 would be what, what would be required for this bill to to succeed. Uh, That's, you're going down Gail's line of questions. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Right, thank you. <clears throat> OK, Mary Fee. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to ask about um, specific equality groups that, that potentially um, are, are, are more at risk. Are you aware um, of, of any children within specific groups that are more likely to be subjected to, to, to physical um, punishment? I know, Lucy and, and Maureen, you have both spoken briefly about the, the, the people that you work with, um, and I'd be interested to hear a bit more about that and if any of the other panel members have, have any evidence they can give us. Autistic young people are um, more vulnerable, both emotionally and um, they're more fragile in a lot of senses. So in that sense, they are more susceptible um, to that. But I would, I would qualify that with the family and my experience of the families that we work with, where we have young people um, in high levels of distress. A lot of that response from parents is about how to try and, and keep everybody safe in that situation. So um, the... the, the the, the language around punishment really doesn't feature so f so frequently in the work that, that we're doing and with the families that we support because actually it, it's about coping and how do we put the supports in to help 
that better coping. And when we look at autistic young people, how they perceive punishment, their ability to join those cause and effects, they see the world in a different way, so they wouldn't necessarily understand why something is happening in a certain way. Um, I think that's an important part to consider in terms of an autistic person. OK, thank you. Um, yes, I would echo that as well, but I would also like to add that um, I'm going to agree with, disagree slightly with the Children's Commissioner here on this bill and its relationship to restraint and seclusion, because I have myself been witness to a child being dragged along the side of a swimming pool under the umbrella of restraint. To me, that's assault. That's not restraint. So what I would like to see from this bill is maybe not, maybe standing alone, it won't um, change things, but maybe working with policy. But I don't see it as something separate. I would see it as something, if we're going to have inclusion, why would we exclude that group mm. from this bill? If we want inclusion, inclusion across society, then surely children with profound and multiple learning disabilities and autism shouldn't be considered as separate. I think that this bill should work with the other policies because, as I said earlier, we've got great um, child protection policies and everything in place, and yet this is still happening. So I, I would disagree with that and say that I would like to see this working in partnership with other policies, but not separate from it. Okay. Um, just to add what everybody else has already said, so um, in terms of, for example, disabled children, I know there are international studies that show that disabled children are more likely to be um, fun punished physically, but um, we don't have sort of clear evidence to show that this is a trend in Scotland itself. And um, there's sort of a similar presumption around uh, certain ethnic minorities <coughs> that there are, I think, especially studies in the US show that certain ethnic minorities are more likely to use physical punishment when it comes to their children. But actually, a 2006 study from the Joseph Brown Tree uh, Foundation found that that wasn't the case in the UK. Um, I think what is really important to note here is what has already been mentioned by Alison and Maureen uh, and Lucy, actually, is that it's really about the support and the awareness campaign and that you try to include everybody and um, particularly vulnerable children, vulnerable parent, parents, and that it's much more about creating societal change and that this leg legislation and the awareness campaign that comes along with it is really key to try to change perceptions in society and make it very clear. And I think that will really help with, for example, what Maureen was just talking about, uh, sort of having people having more of an idea of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. I think also the evidence base for that and the figures for that um, might, you know, needs it, it could be researched a little bit more because um, often if if a family have reported through the child protection route, often the families feel it just goes through the process, so it's like there's no outcome. So that's not recorded then, you know, so often it's under recorded. So there's more, more cases of these happening than is actually recorded. And in our submission to the committee, we actually called for um, more research and monitoring when it comes to this. Um, and I think, again, an awareness campaign will help with that. And then you can um, see where particular maybe support services are needed more or mm -hmm. what a campaign going forward needs to focus on. And I think, again, what Joanna said in the previous panel is really key about that being a sustained uh, awareness campaign. Okay. I'm going to bring Fulton McGregor in as a short supplementary. Yes, yeah, just a supplementary um, panel. Good, good morning, panel. Um, the, you were talking there about the child protection process. I'm wondering if, you, if, if you've got any thoughts on how, if this um, bill is passed, how, how that will um, impact on the current child protection process, and, I, and I'm, I'm talking about just now, so if a, a child maybe goes to school or whatever and, and says, you know, um, that, that they've been hit by a parent, then a child protection process is, is, is then initiated. How do you think uh, removing a uh, justifiable assault will impact on that process? Oh, well, that's a big question. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be a trick question, sorry. No, I'm not sure I can answer it, but I would like to hope that um, if, if, if the family, say, went through the child protection 
process and still the outcome wasn't favourable, but the family felt there was still an assault had taken place, that then this could come into play. But I don't really know, actually, is the honest answer, um, how, how it would impact. Okay. Mary. Thank you, Camille. Can I just come back to the point that you've just made, Maureen, when you say if the family are sure an assault has taken place, are you talking about um, a, a young person being in a care setting or a school setting? Yes, I am. So, so yeah. yeah, I, yeah, I, I just yeah, wanted I to, to, yes, to clarify that, yeah. um, which yeah, is I why am. you're so concerned about the issue of restraint. Yes. Because it's yeah. used in the school setting. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, Alison, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to quickly add, add about the, the groups of um, families that, um, that, that you work with, because I know culturally they, they are quite different from um, the, the rest of the families that are represented. Yes, uh, very different uh, cultural approaches to parenting and no way of, of learning, no roots of learning about any other approaches. Um, a lot of people saying, well, this is just a, a racist approach. And I would say, well, I was hit a lot. It doesn't make my father a monster. It just means that he comes from a different time, just like some people come and have newly arrived from a different place geographically. It just means that um, attitudes have changed. Um, and... We spend a lot of time with women um, supporting their learning around uh, human rights and responsibilities and child protection. That's also about their own safety and understanding that um, their experience of domestic abuse is against the law. And that's a really important handle, as, as Amy said. You know, if, if we're saying that women uh, should be uh, free from violence in the home, and I'm old enough to remember a time when men were, were saying and supported for saying, well, it's none of your business if I beat my wife. Um, if, if we're supporting women to learn their right to safety, then it's, it's not a, a huge leap to say, well, your child also has a right to phys physical and emotional well-being. Uh, but a lot more of that work has to be done. And would all of the panel agree that whatever support, is, support services that are put in place or enhanced if this legislation um, passes will be crucial? Um, because it can't be a kind of standard support service and education service that's put into support families. It needs to, to vary depending on which type of family and the circumstances that the family are in. And, and currently, the, the health visitors really struggle because they're seeing very good parents, very committed parents in extremely uh, difficult circumstances, uh, severe levels of trauma themselves, trying to do their best, but still using the kind of parenting that I was brought up with and that they were brought up with. Um, and the only way that they can help the, the mother, it is in our case, to learn is through an interpreter. And the interpreter may be sitting there saying, this is racist, why, why are you talking to a white person about this? Just don't tell them anything. So, I mean, we have great concerns about the role of interpreting, the lack of uh, support in first languages, the, the um, lack of trauma-informed support. Mm. So the, the health visitors are in a quandary as well, and I think quite frequently the social workers are, are frequently a little bit perplexed as to what to do. And we see <clears throat> excuse me, very uneven responses from social work, and many social workers are fantastic, and many aren't. Many have a very punitive approach um, and I would say it is um, institutional racism in, in some cases. OK. Thank you. Oliver Mundell. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Maureen, I was really interested um, in, in uh, your evidence. and I just wondered whether it would concern you uh, some of the things we've heard previously, both last week and today, that actually changing this legislation won't uh, see any significant increase in prosecutions. Well, um I would imagine it would see an increase in, in prosecutions with the group I work with. Um, and I say that because um, already I have supported a group of families who have been to court. They ha their cases have gone to court. They're sitting at court. We don't know for how long they're sitting at court. They've not been heard yet. And we're talking several years. So had this been law, I think that would have been a far quicker process for them, not so stressful. Their children their children have been subjected to an assault, but the children have, in my opinion, suffered trauma since the day it happened. That trauma is still with them while 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 their cases sit there waiting to be heard. Can I just clarify, when you talk about your, the families you work with being in, in court, they're taking someone else to court, they're not being 
prosecuted no, not, for an no, assault. They're, yeah, sorry. It, when I'm speaking, it's not um, the the families I support have all been their children have all been subjected to abuse in in a care setting or right. or in an education setting, not in the family. Okay, home. thank you. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you uh, for that. Um, I also wanted to ask, really, all of the all, all, all of the, the panelists who work with families, whether uh, the families you work with sort of trust the, the government or the state when it when it comes to, to parenting and the, and their family life. Um, is in, do, do you find that in all cases they, they find that, that that the law is helpful and uh, that that you know health workers, social workers, do, do, do you think that sometimes? You know, there is a breakdown in trust there. That's really my question. I suppose within within my experience of the families that we work with, they've often had to fight quite hard to get the support um, that, that, that they then have in place. So there is a sense of um, feeling like they're needing to be a very loud voice in a large system that can be difficult to navigate, which I think perhaps has an impact on how they, they potentially view um, agencies as supportive or perhaps obstructive. Um, there's a multi-agency approach to all the supports for the families that we work with, and sometimes that's working very well, and they, they feel those pr props are, are very helpful and useful. But there is a sense sometimes that families feel as though they're they're fighting for things that they need or they feel they they need as a family. It's fine. Um, I'll move on uh, to, to to ask. I mean, do do you think? Uh, where, where parents are using physical punishment, that they, they always have an evil intent or an intention to cause injury? Could or do I you think it's your, more complicated mm, than that? So. Could I go back to your previous question um, and just say that um, I think I think there's a, there's a huge level of fear among the women that we support, especially when they, they begin their journey with us. Huge level of fear um, about social work, about the role about police, about the state. Uh, refugees have to prove a well-founded fear of persecution to get their asylum application recognised. So they've come from um, environments where they shouldn't trust anybody, certainly not the state, and certainly not somebody who's you know, an, uh, seen as an arm of the state. So there's, there's degrees of terror around social work and police intervention that we work very hard on. But that becomes more difficult if um, interpreters are used who aren't effective, or if, or if social work, um, social workers, some social workers, a minority, are taking a, a punitive approach and a very um, uh, colourblind, a uh, colourblind approach in that they're not seeing those people's journeys and those those people's uh, context. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to go back to the, the, the mm. next question, I was going to ask. Um, do you think that uh, where physical punishment is used by parents that there's always uh, an evil intent uh, or an intention to cause injury? I, mean, I think um, most parents, as Amy already said at the beginning, want the best for their child. Um, and a lot of it has to do maybe with how you were brought up as well. And I think that's why, again, the awareness campaign is so key. And um, why we really need to see this as sort of a long-term um, change in society in our perceptions. And the fact is that just like with uh, smoking in pubs, um, we now know, uh, we have all this evidence, we have all these studies that show that um, smacking or using physical punishment on children leads to all these kinds of problems. Again, like the previous uh, panel said, it doesn't mean that if you experience physical punishment, you will end up doing X, Y, Z. But given all the studies, we know that children who um, receive physical punishment compared to children who don't have higher issues when it comes to antisocial behavior, violent um, behavior, yeah, or with, aggression with, themselves. With due respect, it's not really what I'm asking. I'm asking whether parents always uh, would have an evil intent or an intention to no. cause injury when using physical punishment? Um, I, I don't think they, do, they would. Um, I think the smacking of children comes from a, a, a long history of what was normal and what we thought was harmless for a long time, which we now know it's not harmless anymore. Um, I think, and I've experienced this as a parent, there's sometimes this assumption that actually to be a good parent you should be smacking your child, and that sometimes still permeates through society. Um, 
and that at the core of it, though, there is still this idea that you are inflicting pain in an attempt to manage behaviour, and we wouldn't do that to adults um, in our society. We don't do that to adults in Scotland. So there is a slight question of why do we still think it's OK to do that to children, and where do we put children in society if we're, if we're doing that? So I think the, the, the sort of supplementary to that, which is really my final question, is, is, is why then do we, do we not uh, ban physical punishment of, of children? Why, why, why are we picking off uh, you know, a, a defence uh, that we've heard this morning uh, from the Children's Commissioner isn't going to increase prosecutions, is not going to, to necessarily have you know, a, a sort of revolutionary impact in and of itself. Why not make a clearer statement that physical punishment of children is, is wrong in our legislation? <laughs> Happy to come in again. Um, I think... Um, as we discussed, there is an issue of popular opinion and how we work with the public around this. And also the evidence from New Zealand and Ireland is that when we take these steps, smacking stops um, or, or decreases quite significantly. So I'm, I'm not an expert around legislation, but I think there might be an argument around making sure that we're doing this with the public um, and with, with, the, with society in Scotland and bringing them with us in this conversation around how we parent and around positive parenting. And also making sure that, as the rest of the panel has discussed, there is that wraparound support to help parents. And again, I think the previous panel mentioned that the, obviously this doesn't prevent us from going back in the future mm -hmm. and saying that actually more is needed, but this is sort of where we're at in Scotland right now. And Alex Hamilton and a brief supplementary. Thank you, convener. I have a brief su supplementary on Oliver Mundell's question. Would the panel agree that if we brought in a new offence to ban physical punishment, that we might actually um, end up doing what both uh, what all um, opponents of this bill fear, which is criminalising all parents? Because immediately, if you create an offence, then uh, of physical punishment, then you remove that element of judgment that a, a, an attending police officer or a social worker would apply. Um, that by removing the legal defence, we know that we send a clear message to parents. You say you still have autonomy to parent your children, but you will no longer have a legal defence to lean into should you use physical punishment. Whereas an offence would immediately blanket criminalise every parent who ever raised a hand in any way to their child. There's a question in there. That is Somewhere. a question. Do if you agree anyone, with yeah. that, that? That might that might actually make 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 the make the criminalisation of parents more likely. Yes, I think it would, and I, th I think probably a, a staged approach would work better. I think once we've got parenting skills in all schools, in every school curriculum, at all ages. Um, maybe in twenty years' time, then we bring in the the complete law. But at the moment, I think. It's an acknowledgement, um, as uh, Nora said, it's an acknowledgement of where Scotland is at this moment in time. OK, thank you. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. Um, I, I firstly just want to uh, apologise to, to Maureen Phillip for my um, earlier su uh, supplementary question. It, it wasn't intended to be a trick question and, uh, and, <laughs> um, and, put, and put you on the spot with that. So, um, and that your evidence has been really good. I think what I was trying to, to, to explore that point was that from my own point of view, and I wanted to see here from other people, was that I don't think that actually a lot would change because social work and police would still need to go out. If there's been an allegation, they would need to identify if there's been significant harm eh, caused. They would need to make judgments on that, and it would all be part of a very, very thorough process, the child protection process, um, which, you know, and, and, and that's what we're saying on. But, but on that point as well, I was quite interested um, to hear your opening remarks, um, Amy Johnson, in terms of um, where this bill sits in, in the continuum of um, offences against children um, and uh, how you think that, that passing this legislation can help with that. Because one of the frustrations that I've had as, as, as an MSP in my previous work, and I'm sure you've all had too, is it's actually extremely difficult to bring people to justice for really harmful acts against children. So ha that's why I'm really kind of not buying into the argument we're going to have a whole you know, bunch of prosecutions um, because of passing this legislation. So I wonder what your thoughts on that, though. Well, I agree. <laughs> and also, I think I'd add to that this continuum of violence within families as well. And if you look at New Zealand and the campaign that was associated with their legislation, their It's Not OK campaign um, looked at how violence is not acceptable within families, um, including domestic violence and domestic abuse, as we'd call it in Scotland. Um, 
And I think it's important also to look at how this bill is supported by other strategies and policies in Scotland around violence against women and girls, um, specifically Equally Safe, the strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, which states that um, violence against women and girls in any form has no place in our vision for a safe, strong and successful Scotland, and also states that violence will stop, damages, health, well-being, limits freedom and potential, and is a violation of the most fundamental human rights. And I think it's very hard for me to work out how we can continue with this um, justification of assault of children in any form and within that continuum and still move ahead with a strategy around violence in Scotland. And do you think that, uh, that passing this uh, bill will help um, practitioners out there to, to maybe identify patterns here that you're talking about? Because, I, I, I mean, I stick to what, what I said originally. I still I think that even with the bill passed, I think that, you know, uh, people will go out and make judgments and they'll certain things won't be prosecuted. Be, do you think they'll um, be able to see patterns emerging and, uh, you know, whereas something that's maybe seen as, well, that's kind of OK just now, will maybe be able to be looked at? I hope it's also supported with, for example, the Domestic Abuse Act, where you see a pattern of behaviour being acknowledged mm -hmm. within that legislation. And things, you know, there's a step away from an incident-based approach towards acknowledging patterns of behaviour that are cause harm and humiliation to children and young people. And I think Bruce um, already mentioned that in the last panel, where hopefully this will sort of increase early intervention and increase the support families receive or parents receive and children as well. So, yeah. I'm hopeful that the new initiative from the Scottish Government to increase trauma awareness and all frontline staff in all agencies should have an impact on this because I think if, if we grow an awareness of trauma, the impact on trauma of people's behaviour and how we negotiate uh, and communicate more um, with, with people who are severely traumatised, uh, and we talk about children generally that we work with are you know, have got scored very highly indeed on the ACEs scale. Um, I, th I think that is also a building brick which will help towards this process of making, you know, making Scotland violence free. Thank you. Fulton, are you? OK, Thanks. Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thank you for your evidence so far. Um, would you say that any money funding um, spent on the implementation of this bill should be classed as preventative spend. Seeing nods from yeah. everybody, yeah. so yeah, I think that's uh, pre yeah, pretty um, straightforward. Um, Amy, you said that in, in response to a question from um, Alex Cole Hamilton about the um, current law and the changes that were made um, a few years ago of uh, punishment of children, there's a lack of clarity in society about what is actually um, not even just acceptable, but, but in the, the eyes of the law using implements where, you know, you're allowed to smack a child. Do you think that we're talking about an awareness raising campaign as part of this bill, should it be implemented, but do you think that there should be an awareness raising campaign happening now? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that should cover, you know, you know, I think the primary focus should be violence against children and young people, but it should cover what's normalised and what's justified and what's acceptable within Scotland and related to violence as a whole. And do you think that that would go some way, um, again, in response to Annie Wells' question about taking the public along with us, um, there seems to be a, a misunderstanding as to what this bill actually is looking to achieve. Um, so we should actually be doing that as part of taking the public along with us at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. OK. Um, you, you'll have seen that um, the children's convener in the last um, panel has said that the financial memorandum as it stands should actually be looked at separately from what is actually happening. And certainly this wider discussion has opened up a conversation about support that's currently available. And I think you've all mentioned that. I just wondered um, about the awareness raising campaign as well as, 
you know, what, what we should be doing already in terms of trauma-informed, um, not just frontline staff, but communities as a whole as well. Um, where do you think that the, the gaps are that might be looked at once we start the awareness raising around this whole issue? Awareness raising is done um, in one language and based or two in Scotland and based on the assumption that everybody has uh, an understanding and a buy-in to issues around equality and social justice and, and human rights, it won't reach the people who are already very vulnerable and already being uh, approached in a, in a punitive way. So the impact would be disproportionately on marginalised new ethnic minority communities, and I mean asylum-seeking and refugee communities. And that would be a dangerous position to be. We're already in a difficult position on that. Um, but it would put us in a more difficult position unless we took that prevent those preventative measures very, very seriously. And that means costing them properly and saying, right, it needs to be in first languages and it needs to be culturally aware and trauma-informed. OK. Anyone else? Oh, OK, thank you. Sorry, just Sorry. in terms of talking about costing and the financial aspect of it, I think it's really vital to realise that as preventative measures, you're going to save costs in the long term. Um, you know, yeah. yeah. So um, maybe this does need more than 20,000, but in terms of reaching, especially um, sort of the communities that Alison is talking about, that is work that actually should be done anyways. And um, again, like Amy said, linking it to wider issues around violence in society, violence in homes. Um, all of this work should be going on anyways. And to increase our capacity and increase our resources that are directed towards that work is really important. Um, so just one final question, convener, for me. We, we, we keep talking about or we keep hearing in evidence this word assault and violence and you know that there obviously are current laws in place that should prevent um, violence against anyone whether it's children or within the family or women um, and obviously you know awareness raising of that is vital. We've had um, representations from members of the public that say I should be able to and I think that there's a, a, a gap that we have in our explanation of the difference between an assault on a child and violence in the home, against, whether it's against anyone, and what parents are coming to us and saying, a slight tap on the back of the hand or a slight tap on the back of the thighs, etc., etc. Is there a difference or should we just not be lifting our hands to children in any circumstances whatsoever? our hands to children there's a, a slight tap on the back of the hand if you've had no sleep it can be a very heavy slap or if you've had a bad day or if you've been tortured or you've been raped across um, you know parts of Africa and the Mediterranean then you know you're going to be in a state where you can't measure that so to, to, so to have a, an absolute ban makes far more sense and I think it's a lot easier to follow and you will get people interpreting that slight um, sort of you know, touch very differently and how are you going to measure that? And again, what sort of message are you sending to children? Yeah. And a slight tap on the hand for somebody who has got a um, complex sensory system could escalate to a full-blown incident which would then lead to the restraint. So in many ways, the ban would prevent a lot. Add exactly onto that point when you've got a young person that's in a high level of distress and you might see some form of, um, I suppose, what could be deemed violent behaviour physically intervening, and that can cause that stress transaction to, to multiply and make the situation a lot worse. Okay. Yeah, it was also discussed at the previous panel, but that was found under equally protected that children, uh, parents don't often start off abusing or seriously assaulting their children. It starts with lighter or milder physical punishment. And that's not to say there's a necess you know, if you, if you smack a child, that's what's going to happen. But if, we, if we're trying to minimize risk around, around that, then I think it's necessary to say that we don't raise our hand to children at all. Just gonna bring Alex in on a yeah, just, uh, I mean, You've largely answered it there, but I mean, as a supplemental to Gail Ross's question, um, we have had uh, empirical research from 
academics who oppose a change in the law to say that so-called backup smacking is actually a more effective tool of parenting than other sanctions. Um, are you? Would you agree that, or do you think that, um, b that by removing the option to back up smack, then we are impeding the normal parenting behaviour of reasonable parents who can always retain control? No, but we, we need to be giving uh, a lot clearer messages on what par a positive parenting is. I know people who don't smack their children, and the children probably wish they would because there's huge levels of uh, emotional abuse and coercive control, uh, which is, you know, is the same thing. Um, so we need to be sending out messages <coughs> around positive parenting rather than saying don't smack, do support in this way, positive parent, positive messages. Thank you. Do any other committee members have anything they wish to ask? No, in which case, um, Gordon, if you have any questions you wish to put through me to the panel. Thank you, Convener. If I might ask just um, two questions, and perhaps just of Nora Rurig, I think, on behalf of the Human Rights Commission. Um, I was just interested in seeing the, the paper that you submitted that you indicated case law demonstrating a general tra tra trajectory sorry, towards prioritising uh, children's rights over parental rights. I think that's something that was covered in the first panel a bit. Um, do you see parents' rights or children's rights as one being more important than the other? And that's the first question. Um, I mean, so in terms of, I think we already talked about this earlier, in terms of international human rights law, it's very clear that um, the best interest of the child needs to be um, a priority. But I don't actually see it being about the rights of the parents versus the rights of the child, because again, it's about a change in society and creating more non-violent society as a whole and linking it to what Amy has already talked about, violence in the home um, and wider issues that we know there is a connection in terms of physical punishment and domestic abuse, for example. If convener, I might just ask one further question, question. and um, it's this. Who then should decide for the parents of the children? Is it is it not just saying it's people out with the family who will decide instead of the parents and children? Um, no, I think in a lot of ways you're actually giving more of a voice to children. So you're creating more of a platform for communication where you're recognizing that both have rights and that it's about them as a family union, union and um, how they interact with each other and really sort of the messages you send to, to a child. Again, if you're using physical punishment, what sort of message are you sending to the child? Um, we know in terms of long-term studies what children who um, receive physical punishment are more likely to have sort of antisocial behavior, but also in terms of that communication, I think um, sending more positive parenting messages is much more useful. Mr. Finney, just to add anything. I have no questions for the witnesses, but would you indulge me in a point of information, if I, if I could, please, um, convener? And that's about the issue that's the, the figure of 20,000 that's been mentioned on a number of occasions. <coughs> the, the issue of promoting awareness and understanding of the bill is covered in paragraphs 27 to 31 with the financial memorandum. And the 20,000 figure is actually the Scottish Government's figure. And in fairness to them, they, they state in paragraph 30 that a, a, a full um, marketing campaign would cost between 200,000 and 475,000. They then go on, and to give balance, they then go on to, to, to say that uh, using some existing resources, like existing websites and information to key stakeholders, that they don't think it would need a full campaign. Um, it, that's not the view that I formed in relation to um, the figure of 300,000, which is the figure on the bill. The background to how that figure comes up is outlined in paragraph 29, and it relates to relative campaigns that the Scottish Government have run over the period and have published figures. So the, the figure for the campaign that we took as the comparator was 303,000, so we've rounded it to 300,000, and that would cover a period of approximately excuse me, six months before and after the law came in were the bill to be passed. So it's just that point of clarification. Thank, Thank you. you for that clarification. 
Okay, our, uh, thank you for your evidence this morning, panel. It's been very helpful. Our next meeting will be on the 15th of March in Portree on the island of Skye. Our meeting begins at four o'clock in the Fingal Centre and members of the committee will hold a public Q&A session immediately before that, starting at 3.15. The committee has previously agreed to hold discussions of evidence in private, so we'll now move into private session. <laughs>